If there was a Hellcat equivalent car from the 80s, it would definitely be the Grand National. The top trim GNX or Grand National Experimental could run down a Ferrari F40 in the quarter mile and was available in any color as long as it was black. Buick took the road less travel. Rather than a large, naturally aspirated V8, it boasted a single turbo 3.8 liter V6 that would even show its big cousin, the Corvette, its taillights. <laughs> Today on Explain, we will dive into one of the first factory sleeper cars, the Buick Regal Grand National. The energy crisis of the 1970s put car manufacturers like GM in a chokehold, forcing them to look for alternatives of the large V8s that dominated this lineup. Buick specifically introduced the 3.8 liter 231 V6 in 1975 with a whopping 105 horsepower due to the emission standards. This engine wasn't initially designed for performance, but would become the building block for some very powerful Buicks to come. In 1976, Buick's engineering team built a pace car for the Indianapolis 500 that ditched the 455 cubic inch V8 in the previous year's Buick Century for a more powerful and smaller 3.8 liter V6 that used a Ray J turbocharger and made over 300 horsepower tripling the stock output. It had beefier internals, dish pistons, which lowered the compression all the way down to six to one from its original eight to one and ran 22 pounds of boost. This power plant outran the old 455 cubic inch V8 by a nice margin and the 1976 pace car was a successful proof of concept that would trickle down into Buick's road cars. In 1978, the Buick Regal was redesigned to be smaller, lighter, and with a trim called the Sport Coupe. This added the 3.8 liter V6, but with the addition of a turbocharger, making eight PSI boost for 165 horsepower and 265 pound-feet of torque. It also introduced knock sensors. Think of it as a microphone attached to the engine that listens for detonation. Once detected, the engine would pull ignition timing to protect from internal damage. Being non-intercooled, the knock box, as we call it, was absolutely necessary. The success of the new Regal and the Buick's win at NASCAR would have them reveal a new model to rejuvenate their performance image that was overshadowed by Chevrolet and Pontiac, entered the 1982 Grand National. This probably looks different than you would expect. Now, the first year Grand National, unlike popular belief, wasn't black. It was silver with red pinstripes and had an underpowered 4.1 V6 that was non-turbocharged and making only 125 horsepower. Very few 1982 Grand Nationals have the turbo V6, which you could tell by the signature hood bulge. The Grand National would go on a hiatus for 1983 and come back in an all-black tuxedo for 1984. The 3.8 liter turbo V6 bumped to 200 horsepower and 300 pound-feet of torque by getting rid of the blow-through carburetor and going with sequential fuel injection and computer-controlled ignition. It was only five horsepower behind the 1984 Corvette and a horsepower race would soon develop between the two. By 1986, the Grand National introduced air-to-air -air intercooling and horsepower increased to 235 and 330 pound-feet of torque. Differences actually extend beyond intercooling with the revised turbocharger that had a larger compressor and boost increased to 12 PSI and actually overpowered the Corvette in 1986 and 1987. But Buick wouldn't even stop there. They would get the help of ASC McLaren to build one of the quickest cars in the world at that time. For the final year, 1987, Buick introduced the limited production GNX, Grand National Experimental. 547 Grand Nationals were then sent off to McLaren Performance Technologies and upgraded with Garrett Hybrid Ceramic Turbos, larger air-to-air -air intercoolers to lower those intake air temperatures since boost increased to over one bar at 15 PSI. The exhaust systems was revised to be less restrictive and the EEPROM chip had a GNX specific tune. All of these modifications added up to 300 horsepower and a staggering 420 pound feet of torque, which was very similar to the 1976 pace car in power. The GNX wiped every Corvette, every Camaro, every Mustang, and every Firebird in 1987 with a 12.7 second quarter mile at 113 miles an hour, even faster than the esteemed Ferrari F40. 
Also in 1987, if you wanted a total sleeper, you could get the Buick Regal Turbo T package. This was cheaper than the Grand National while still having the Grand National's 245 horsepower turbo intercooled V6. It was actually lighter than the Grand National as well, theoretically making it faster. Even after the end of the Turbo V6 Regals in 1987, the 3.8 Buick would live on in the 1989 Pontiac Trans Am Turbo. It received revised heads, pistons, oil cooler, and a more efficient intercooler, bumping power up to 250 horsepower and 340 pound-feet of torque. The Pontiac ended up taking the throne as the fastest accelerating quarter mile car in the US with a 4.6 second zero to 60 and a 13 and a half quarter mile at 101 miles per hour. <laughs> Top speed was 153 miles per hour, ungoverned, and this solidified the Buick 3.8, and whatever it was in, it would be a tough car to beat in a straight line. The 3.8 Buick engine is very biased towards lower RPM grunt and torque, unlike more exotic turbo engines of the year like the Porsche 944 Turbo. The 3.8 reaches peak torque early in the power band, contributing to its awesome acceleration and 0-60 performance. And when not in booze, these cars got decent MPGs, 17 city and 25 highway, which is still decent for a performance car even in today's strict emissions and economy standards. The 3.8 turbo in factory form was impressive, but the aftermarket took these engines to all new heights. Drop-in ball bearing turbochargers, larger injectors, fuel pump, and race chip tunes for the EEPROM have seen 400 to 600 wheel horsepower depending on boost levels, and a nine second Grand Nationals isn't even rare. The performance capabilities of the 3.8 is very underrated compared to larger and more widely available small block and big block Chevy engines. Turbocharged engines will always have a wider window of capability since boost levels can be adjusted for the desired goal. Now the Grand National and GNX have always been under the radar simply because GM didn't want the Grand National to overshadow the Corvette, especially on paper, the Grand National was a faster car. Also the GNX, all 547 were allocated to dealers that wanted to sell them for markup. So the press circuit really couldn't get their hands on those cars. So you really don't have a lot of information out there that's publicized on these type of cars, which is a good and a bad thing. Yeah, people don't know about them, but at the same time, they're so rare now that they really do fetch a premium so if you do have your hands on a grand national or especially a gnx you are sitting on black gold and i think it's safe to say that the grand national wasn't a hellcat for its time it was the grand national for its time so i hope you guys enjoy these videos thanks for 100 000 subscribers it means the world we're coming out with much more bangers in the next couple of days subscribe peace